and today we're going to be discussing senior dogs. Now, Merrick has really just been the leader in changing the way pet food is, is done today. And if you look at the Merrick bag, you'll see that it says in very large letters, nothing's hidden, where it's made, and it's made in the USA, and what's inside the bag. And, and we know that there are problems in pet foods today, but you're never going to find those problems with pet foods. They've got a wide variety of dry and wet dog and cat food. You can get it at Petco or many, many other stores. Um, recipes in, in Merrick have USDA inspected deboned meat as the first ingredient and the, the finest produce. And I know it's the stuff that my baby Kalba likes to eat. Now, during the course of our presentation, one of the highlights is, and I'm going to warn you, that one lucky participant will receive a free voucher for a 25-pound bag of new grain-free Real Texas dry beef dog food. That's a $60 value, and Merrick will also donate a bag in the winner's honor to National Mill Dog Rescue. Now, I do want to let you know something, that we're going to ask the questions and you better be ready to type quickly. <clears throat> the reason is that we have people, uh, the last time, pe people are guessing as to what I'm going to say, and we had answers coming in before I even finished the question. So you have to be ready to type, and we pick the first correct answer. Uh, so today's presenter that so many people have been looking forward to and expecting is Jennifer Kachnik. She's the president of the Gray Muzzle Organization, which provides grants to animal rescues and shelters for senior dog programs. She's the author of the award-winning book, Your Dog's Golden Years, A Manual for Senior Dog Care, and is a certified canine massage therapist and Reiki practitioner. Her business, Canine Wellness LLC in Colorado, provides alternative therapies for injured, post-surgery, and senior dogs. And Jennifer will be answering questions, not only on the webinar, but even after the webinar. And I'll give you the details as well, and I'll even um, show you what we're doing. So now, I'm going to switch things over to Jennifer, and we're going to put her, I'm going to make her the uh, presenter. Oh, thanks, Harlan. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining this Senior Dog Seminar, and thanks, to for Doggy Food Post and Merrick for providing these um, wonderful seminars for pet owners. Um, just briefly about who I am, like Harlan said, I'm the president of the Gray Muzzle Organization, and we give grants to shelters and rescues nationwide for senior dog programs, um, for therapy dogs, um, to get them adopted, medical care, hospice care, uh, different programs like that. And I'm also an author of a book, Your Dog's Golden Years. It's the manual for senior dog care. It includes natural remedies and complementary options. And uh, the book did just win a first prize in the USA News Best Book Awards and a silver finalist in the Benjamin Franklin uh, Book Awards in that pets and animal category. And it's really unique because it has 20 authors from around the country. They're all canine experts writing chapters on their expertise. So there's a lot of resources and a lot of information for you. I have a business here in Denver where we provide alternative and natural therapies for dogs, including massage, laser therapy, energy healing, and acup acupressure. And I'm a volunteer trainer for canine companions for independence, um, raising and training service dogs for them. So over the next hour, um, Briefly, we're going to cover what is a senior dog, benefits of, a, of having a senior dog versus a younger one, the most common ailments that they suffer from, symptoms, um, what you can do to prevent those ailments or at least delay them, signs and signals that dogs give us that they're in pain that may not be obvious to most of us, nutrition for seniors, supplements, and there's a lot of alternative and natural therapies available for, for senior dogs out there we're going to cover briefly. We're going to talk about some end-of-life help and resources, when to get another dog, and some pet trust planning options that are available to you. Okay. So 
So what is a senior dog? Um, well, their lifespan depends on their size. So the smaller the dog, the longer the lifespan, the larger the dog, the shorter the lifespan generally. And a senior is, is a, a dog is considered a senior where in that last 25% of their lifespan. So a small, say, chihuahua, four to five pounds, um, could easily live to be 20 or older. And so that dog's going to be a senior around 14 to 16. A St. Bernard, like I have, he's well over 150 pounds. Um, his lifespan usually around eight or nine. So he's a senior between six and seven. And then uh, sort of a medium-sized dog, your, your lab out there, maybe, you know, 75, 85 pounds. Um, they could live to be around 13 to 15. And so they're a senior around eight to 10. So oftentimes people think a senior is around seven or eight, and that's true, but it depends on the size of the dog. And so this chart here just kind of shows you um, the relative age of your dog, you know, in human years. So if you have a dog that's seven years old, and he weighs about, oh, you know, 70 pounds. Um, he's roughly uh, about a 50-year-old in human years. So what are the benefits of senior dogs, and particularly adopting those senior dogs? More and more people are going into shelters and asking for senior dogs, which, you know, didn't happen years ago. And, and so basically what you see is what you get. There's no surprises. Their physical size, their temperament is already established. Oftentimes you have a lot of information um, from their past, what they like and don't like. Um, they've already been trained, basically. They have the basic obedience, usually. They're house trained. And um, that, you know, as far as you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you can. They can learn just as, just as quickly and easily as a younger dog. They're past that chewing phase. They're not chewing, you know, the shoes, the rugs, the plants, that kind of thing. They do generally require less exercise. Um, you know, they do slow down as they age, so they're not going to be as rambunctious as a puppy or a younger dog and could, you know, be a better fit for a lot of families. Um, they make great, you know, they're great for companionship. Even though they don't often require a lot of exercise, they still need moderate exercise. They still need to get out there and get walking, so they're really great at getting us out there and meeting the neighbors and, um, and getting out there and being sociable. And senior dogs are also a good choice for people that don't want to commit to 20 years of, of owning a dog. So if they just want, a, you know, they're going to be retiring or something, they just want a dog for five years, a senior is a good fit for that. So um, in having a senior, the most there's some common ailments that they suffer from. And I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms to look for. So, um, you know, the first thing, I, I guess, is weight. It's really important to maintain their weight, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, but really taking care of your dog's teeth. I don't think most people realize how important it is to take care of their teeth and gums. So you want to look for signs of gingivitis, tartar, loose teeth, missing teeth, exposed roots, of course, a strong odor. It's important to get their teeth cleaned and examined regularly by your veterinarian. Daily brushing um, is important if you can. They have finger brushes that go on your finger. Even a child's toothbrush with the um, canine toothpaste can be helpful. And a lot of people don't want to brush their dog's teeth, and I get that. Um, I'm one of those people that I don't do it regular either. So there's other things you can do. Giving them raw carrots, you know, some raw vegetables. My dogs like apples and frozen green beans. Um, there's two ropes available. There's edible bones that are meant for dental health. There's powders and things you can put in their food and water that will help get rid of that tartar. And then there's the raw meat bones, which some people like. It's just important to supervise your dogs because the, the bones can fall apart. Um, you know, the dogs can swallow a big chunk, and that can cause other problems. So you want to make sure you supervise. So take care of your teeth, the dog's teeth. And, um, you know, some dogs are more prone to dental problems than others. But if, if the teeth and the gums all get bad, it affects all the organs in the body. It's like a toxin. So it just causes other problems. And so it's really important to keep up with their teeth and dental care. Osteoarthritis, you know, if we all live long enough, we're all going to get some form of arthritis. So are our dogs. And um, 
diagnosis has to be made with x-rays and with a physical exam and by your veterinarian. And the signs can be subtle, you know, stiffness, um, uh, having to, you know, warm up before activity, not being interested in going on walks like they used to be, limping, you know, it's pretty obvious after, after activity. And you might notice some loss of muscle mass and some atrophying going on, particularly in, in the back end. Um, and we're going to talk a few minutes just about signs and signals that dogs give us um, when they're in pain that most people aren't aware of. So larger breed dogs, you're more, they're more prone to get this osteoarthritis and different forms of arthritis. So um, it's important if you have one of those larger breeds to, um, to watch for these signs and signals. Um, sensory loss. You know, as they get older, just like with us, um, they lose their vision, sense of smell, hearing, taste, touch, all these things can be effective, uh, affected. Um, and so, um, example, hearing. If, if suddenly your dog just seems like he's ignoring you, he probably isn't. Chances are he's just having trouble hearing. Um, there was a question on the Facebook page that um, her dog, senior dog, just wasn't eating like he used to. He was eating the treats just fine, but kind of finicky with the food. And that's really common for these older dogs, you know, as the smell and the taste start to go. So um, it's not uncommon for you to maybe try changing up the food, try different types of food, or adding, adding some things to the food that can give it a little more taste and smell. Some things that are good to add, and again, you got to watch those calories. Um, chicken or beef broth is good. you got to watch the sodium, though. Um, I like to use baby food. I can baby food. Uh, most dogs really like. Um, a little cheese, cottage cheese. Um, again, maybe some raw fruits and vegetables in there. Um, canned pumpkin is really good for dogs. It's also very good for the digestive system if you have a dog that's having issues with that as well. So I've got to kind of change things up, add some things to their food, um, and try different foods as they go because that's, that's not uncommon for an older dog to start to get um, finicky as, as time goes. So signs of signals. Oh, dogs give us when they are in pain. You know, we all know the obvious, that they're whimpering, whimpering or um, limping, that kind of thing. But... Um, you know, dogs have been domesticated for thousands of years, and they retained that natural instinct from their wild, wilder days to hide weakness. And showing pain is showing weakness. So they're not going to show you that initially. And, um, you know, they're not like us where, you know, it's really obvious when, when one of us is in pain, everybody knows about it from the onset. So when you see signs that we talked about, the limping, the whining, going to go up and down the stairs, that kind of thing. That's probably at a point where your dog is in some pretty significant pain. Um, so you want to figure out if your dog's in pain prior. We have a list here. Um, so refusing touch or, or refusing touch on a certain part of their body. Tucking the tail under. Whimpering, of course. A fixed stare. Trembling. Changes in eating um, can also be a sign of pain or discomfort. Refusing to get up and move around. Excessive licking on a body part could, could be a sign of pain. Rubbing that, a body part on the furniture, maybe rubbing their hips on the couch or on the wall, that sort of thing. Arching their backs while standing or walking, if that's unusual for them. Um, hiding under furniture. Oh, uncharacteristic aggression. So if your dog suddenly starts maybe growling or, or nipping at a child or another dog, and that's really something he's never done in the past, um, you know, don't assume that he's just getting old and cranky. He's probably in pretty significant pain. And so if your dog does start growling or barking, it's really important to get them to a vet and find out what's going on. Um, sometimes they'll avoid contact with other dogs. They just don't want to play like they used to. Refusal to jump on the bed, um, you know, hop in the car, that kind of thing. Um, slow to climb the stairs, limping, and slow getting up from, you know, a, a laying down position. And fever also can be a sign of pain. And then, you know, when dogs are in pain, they're obviously stressed and they're feeling anxious. And there's a lot of signs of anxiety that dogs give us as well, which we don't have time to go through all of them. But one of them that's interesting is yawning. And, and we assume that just because our dog is yawning, he's tired. And he may be tired. But he also may be... Um, 
trying to calm himself. He may be anxious. So if you see yawning, uh, not by itself, but combined with other signs of anxiety, which could be excessive lip licking or um, excessive blinking of the eyes, if their body language looks different, the tail's tucked under, and so forth. Um, and you just want to look at their surroundings and what's going on with them, because that could be a sign um, that they're stressed out and they're showing some anxiety. So what are some good supplements um, for the senior dog? And we're going to talk about nutrition as well. So it's important, like I said before, to keep your, your dog at a healthy weight. Um, and some breeds, you know, like Labs, for instance, are more prone to getting heavier than others. Um, it's really important to measure the food and know how much food your dog is eating. And most people um, don't do that. They just kind of pour in whatever they think their dog's going to eat. And as he gets older, he's going to become less active. Therefore, he's going to need less calories. Um, and also, older dogs, there was a question, too, about this. They still do need exercise, regular exercise. And it kind of depends what condition they're in, obviously. But um, you can do short spurts of exercise instead of maybe one long walk, maybe two or three short walks. But it's important to um, get them exercise, even if they do have, you know, some arthritis or what have you. You've got to keep those muscles healthy. And again, look for those signs of pain so um, you're not walking the dog too far or doing anything um, that's too severe for the dog. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about other ways you can exercise your dog as well besides walking that are a little easier on their body. So. Um, you want to make sure they always have fresh water available. And if you have a senior and you've got stairs, it's it's really a good idea to have water available on on all levels of your home where the where the dog is going. And then nutrition, you know, um, it's really important. You got to look for those high quality foods. And some people are hesitant to purchase them because of the cost, but um, really they end up being less expensive in the long run. Your dog eats less of this good quality food. They poop less, which is good, and they're going to keep your dog healthier. And so for your money, for the bang, it's really um, it's really well worth your time to investigate and, and get one of the better um, foods out there. And so like with us, you need to read the labels with our food, and the first five ingredients are the most important. important. <clears throat> so one thing to avoid that a lot of people aren't aware of are the byproducts. And animal byproducts, um, you'll see that a lot on the labels. That's basically animal parts that are unfit for human consumption. It can, it includes, you know, blood, teeth, hair, hooves. It can have sick animals, you know, um, animal part, diseased animals. It's just garbage. It really is. So you want to avoid um, foods that have the meat byproducts in them. Um, artificial colorants, obviously, um, salt, corn, um, BHA, anything you can't pronounce. You just want to see, um, you know, fruits and veg vegetables, oats, barley, grains. Um, and, of course, you want to see, instead of the word meat, you really should look for chicken, beef, lamb, bison. Um, it should be very clear what, what kind of um, meat protein and meat sources are in the food and not just the word meat. So a lot of senior dogs, foods are good because one, they'll, they'll have less calories for those older dogs, and two, they're going to have supplements, which are really good for seniors, for their joints. Um, one of them is the glucosamine and the chondroitin. And um, like I said, those are, those are you know, found in a lot of senior foods, so it's good to check out that as well. So um, foods to avoid uh, that are toxic for dogs. You want to avoid onions, raisins, grapes, and this is for all dogs, uh, macadamia nuts, avocado, chocolate is a real bad one, xylitol is um, a sweetener, lemons, tomatoes, nutmeg, garlic, persimmons, any artificial sweetener of any kind. So we talked about a couple helpful supplements for senior dogs, the glucosamine and the chondroitin. MSN is also a good one for the joints. And uh, fish oils are good for 
um, not only the coat and the skin, but it's also good for arthritis as well. And um, coconut oil is another one. I've recently... Um, Jennifer? Uh, yes. Yes, um, can you hear me? The supplements that you're mentioning now, glucosamine, chondroitin, and so forth, are those helpful to be given before the dog turns senior? Will they help joint problems before they occur? Yeah, actually, I've got four large large breed dogs, and in particular in the large breed, yeah, I have all my dogs on, on these supplements, and my youngest is three years of age because, again, you know, they're 80-pound dogs, and it's, it's really likely that um, they are going to have some joint issues. So, um, yes, I mean, it, it certainly can't hurt. Okay, thanks. And, yeah, and the coconut oil does amazing things for their coat. I just put a spoonful in their food, and that might be a good one, too, for the dogs that are getting a little finicky. It's got a, a nice, you know, flavor and, and aroma to it, and um, it, it, it does wonders for the skin, you know, the dogs with the dandruff, and it helps with the shedding as well, I've found. So if you're not feeding your dog, you know, a senior dog food with these um, supplements, um, you should probably give it to it in addition. And, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I teach classes, and a lot of people come to the classes before their dogs are senior just to see what, what can they start doing um, in this regard, knowing that these issues are probably going to come up. Um, and another thing I've been asked is what um, – what can I give my dog over the counter for pain? And it's really important that you don't give any Tylenol or Advil or ibuprofen or anything like that. And the only over-the-counter pain medication that, that I recommend or, or veterinarians would recommend would be the buffered aspirin only. And it's for minor pain. And so if you're not sure if your dog's in pain or not, he's not showing major signs, but maybe he just moves a little slower after a walk or that kind of thing. Um, you should talk to your vet about maybe trying a little buffered aspirin, and the dosage is about 5 to 10 milligrams per pound of dog, you know, every 8 to 12 hours. But you want to talk to your vet because your dog may be on other medication um, that might interfere. But you never want to give anything over the counter um, to your dog um, without talking with your vet. But, it, but um, buffered aspirin would be the only thing that I know of that you could give your dog. Okay, there are um, lots of alternative, natural, and holistic, um, complementary therapies out there that are available for us, but they're also available for our dog, and they work the same way on our dog's bodies. And there are um, professionals out there right now all over the country that provide these services and therapies for your dog. And so we're going to go over some of them um, today. Um, canine massage. And there's different types of body work as well. But it is a therapeutic massage. Um, I had somebody call us once wanting us to give a massage for a dog's birthday. <laughs> and it's not really, it's, it's very much a therapeutic massage, okay? Um, it helps with relaxation. It can boost the immune system. It increases circulation. It decreases inflammation, which is huge for pain. And it can help maintain that muscle tone. It, you know, again, just like with us, um, you know, and, it helps to move the toxins, and dogs need to drink water afterwards, just like um, just like with us. It can help with those um, muscles that are atrophying there on the back end. And I, I teach my clients how to massage their dogs because it really should be done on a daily basis. And you know, when you're sitting there with your dog, you know, it's pretty easy to do. But um, it, it can help keep those muscles healthy and slow down that that atrophy um, as well for some of these dogs. So obviously you want to seek out someone who's certified, someone who's trained um, as a, can a certified, you know, canine massage therapist. Um, and there's different types, again, of massage work that they can do. It's not too costly. It's uh, from $40 to $50 an hour. It depends on the size of the dog. It might be less. But that's something to think about. It's another way to help your dog um, with pain relief. And, again, if you've got dogs that um, just aren't using those, those muscles anymore. And they like it. Usually they like it, just like us. <laughs> so another thing, um, another therapy that is really doing great things for dogs is, is the laser therapy or cold laser therapy. 
and a lot of your chiropractors are using this. You probably, some of you have tried it yourself or, or seen it on TV. It's, it's a wonderful therapy, and it's readily available. It helps reduce pain, inflammation. It, incre it increases and speeds up healing. Um, it, it's good for circulation. It's safe. Of course, it's a drug-free alternative. And um, I use I, I provide this in, for my business, and usually it's dogs with arthritis. And um, it's it's not expensive. A lot of veterinarians provide this as well. It's around twenty to forty dollars a treatment. I've seen I have seen improvement in dogs with one treatment, but depending on the situation, you're probably going to want to get um, you know regular treatments. The dog doesn't feel anything at all. I mean, it's a laser, so you don't want to get it in your eyes or near their eyes or anything. So the dog's eyes should be covered. But um, again, you want to get to get um, someone who's you know trained and certified in in using um, this therapy. But I, I've heard great things, and I've seen um, a lot of dogs really respond to this in a positive way. So it's an option. It's something to think about. Um, and possibly in conjunction to utilize with uh, medications or other therapies that you're doing for your dog. So canine chiropractic care, um, there are specialists out there, veterinarians that specialize in chiropractic care for your dogs, and they're all over the country. Um, they um, treat nerve stress caused by distortions, um, emphasizing on the spine, they help, um, the benefits include flexibility, relief from stiffness and pain. Um, it's also good for those dogs that have the sloppy sit going on, you know. I still have a dog with, with that problem. It's not the best for them to sit that way, um, you know, where they're kind of sitting on, their, on the side of their hip. Uh, so they treat issues that, you know, the neck, do the neck, tail, back pain, disc problems, neurological problems, and joint issues. So... Um, if you're wondering, you know, how do I know if my dog needs to go to um, a chiropractic or maybe get an adjustment? So, again, if they're having a hard time getting up and down those stairs or showing weakness, you know, they're showing signs of pain, something's going on with the joints, um, you might consider um, visiting a canine, a canine chiropractor. Um, traditional veterinary Chinese medicine um, it has been around for, what, centuries. It includes acupuncture as well as the use of herbs. And it can help not only with pain relief, but with, again, that inflammation. If you can get that inflammation down, it helps a lot with the pain and range of motion. It addresses imbalances in the dog's body, and it helps with healing and maintaining health. Um, so there's, there's acupuncture and there's acupressure. And acupuncture utilizes the needles, and acupressure um, the um, therapist will use their hands, the tips of their fingers, on, in the same areas of the body. And I have seen, uh, and I and I've heard too of people that have had huge, um, huge uh, pain relief in their dogs. And usually, again, you will see um, improvement in your dog with one treatment. But again, it might be something that you want to do on a regular basis. It depends on your dog's situation. Um, but if you have a dog that's that's struggling with pain. Um, you might want to consider the um, um, acupuncture or acupressure. And it costs, you know, roughly, again, about 40 to $60. Um, and, and it's readily available. A lot of vets are now offering this. Um, homeopathy. This is a true holistic medicine. This has been around for centuries as well. And it treats the individual, um, you know, the mental, emotional, and physical uh, parts of the body. It includes utilizing natural herbs, you know, and supplements. And so, you know, it's important that the correct formulations for these herbs are utilized. And so you really want to seek a um, trained veterinary um, homeopath to help you with this. But again, um, I, I've seen a lot of dogs really improve from this type of treatment. So it might be something to look into. And, you know, it's pretty cost-effective. And I don't know how many veterinary homeopaths are out there. Um, there are a few. I don't know if they're readily available around the country, but there might be someone that you could um, consult with over the phone as well. So that's another option. 
So we were talking earlier about exercise, and not all dogs, depending on their condition, you know, can go on those long walks. And so swimming, I mean, that is the best exercise for dogs. Um, some people have pools, ponds, lakes, or live by the beach, and that's great if if you can if you can get your dog swimming. Um, hydrotherapy, it's it's physical therapy in the water for dogs, and um, it, it will it will help them with um, you know their endurance and you know their muscle and their quality of life. Um, but if you dose, it's, it's really helpful with those dogs with arthritis and joint issues. So the muscles, like I said, they will atrophy if they're not used, and then the dog just gets weaker and weaker. So this hydrotherapy um, gets the dog using these muscles without putting the stress on the joint, and the water offers a resistance for muscle strengthening. And um, I'm in the Colorado area, and there's a lot of, like, canine rehab centers opening around here, and I think they're opening all over the country. So something you might look at, they provide this service. You can take your dog in and, um, you know, do a free swim, maybe throw the frisbee if your dog likes to do that, or there's therapists like here on top where, um, you know, they will exercise your dog um, as well and make sure he's using those muscles and so forth. So a lot of these centers, too, also offer some of the therapies that I'm talking about today, like the massage and so forth. So um, quality of life scale, you know, um, one thing with senior dogs is, you know, a lot of people don't want to think about they are going to die, we're all going to die. It's perfectly natural, it's perfectly normal, and it's nothing to uh, fear. You know, dogs don't, don't fear death. But it's hard when you get to that point, um, and there's not a lot of resources out there. You know, is your dog suffering? Does he have a quality of life? Do I need to do something? And so... Um, this is a chart by Dr. Alice Villalobos, and she, she's one of the authors in the book. And she kind of gives you um, some questions that you can look at and answer when that time comes, and you add points to it. And then you can de determine whether or not your dog has a quality of life or not, and if maybe you need to make some decisions. So, um, you know, one thing you want to look at is pain. How much pain is the dog in? Is it being managed? Is oxygen necessary? Hunger, is, is the pet even eating? Are you having to coax the pet to eat? Hydration, that's really, um, when dogs get ill, they, they get dehydrated um, very quickly. Are you even able to keep the dog hydrated? Um, hygiene, the pets, they should be kept brushed and clean. Um, can you do that? Um, does your pet even express any joy or any interest? Is he responsive to things around him? Does he seem depressed, um, afraid? Mobility, um, you know, sometimes these dogs, they can't even get up to, to go to the bathroom or anything. Um, so does he need help with a cart? Um, does he even feel like going for a walk? Does he have some seizures? Um, and again, we're not going to go through all of it. There's a, there's a lot more in the book. but um, And then good more, good, uh, more good days than bad. Uh, when the bad days outnumber the good days, then, yeah, quality of life might be compromised. And so, um, and again, yeah, that human-animal bond is no longer possible. So, and then, again, the decision of euthanasia, whether that's something um, you're going to consider or not, um, you know, this is the time, if you are, that you need to start thinking about it. And it's just so tough because in the end, the dogs always, um, you know, they get better and then they get worse and then they get better and then they get worse. And you're like, geez, and, and the guilt. Um, but that's very normal. So um, so there are some resources out there where you can get some help into about making that decision. And hospice care, pet hospice care is also available. And generally it's done at your home with the assistance of your veterinarian. And so that's an option. And it looks like here, you know, when you're looking at these, um, this scale, this, this would be a dog, you know, in a, in a hospice situation. Um, So as far as, uh, you know, the pet loss time, it's really tough. There's not a lot of resources i found to help people when they're about to lose a pet or when they've lost a pet. And, you know, people will often say, oh, just go get another one, and you need someone to talk to. So um, there are actually certified 
pet loss counselors out there that you can talk to for free. And um, you can go to the Association of Pet Loss and Bereavement, and their website is aplb.org, and there's a directory there, and you can find somebody to talk to um, at that time if you need to. And, or even help, help walk you through this um, situation. Um, there is, you know, anticipatory grief. That's the grief that you have before your dog dies. And, and there's just a lot of guilt involved with um, the end of life. Did we do enough? Um, do we wait too long? Um, that kind of thing. Another option um, is animal communication. Animal communication. There's animal communicators out there, and they're sort of like psychics. Um, but, you know, and I was skeptical, I have to admit. I know a lot of people are, but I did try it. And I tell you, I was really shocked. Um, it's important not to give the person very much information, uh, obviously, but I was really, I was really impressed with, um, with, with my session. And it, it can, if it's something you're into, it, it can provide some closure um, if you, if you want to seek an animal communicator at this time, just to find out, um, you know, how much pain your dog's in and that sort of thing. Just to, um, again, some people it helps, some people are interested in it, and that's, that's fine. Um, there's also veterinarians that specialize in home euthanasia, and I don't know how many of you have ever had to deal with the euthanasia at the vet's office, and it's horrible. Um, but there's vets that all they do is they come to your home, and they t and it's nothing like in the office. You're not rushed, and there's there's a chapter in my book about this as well, and you can create your own kind of ceremony, um, and kind of you know make it your own, and um, much more peaceful for yourself and the dog. So um, if you're interested in finding a veterinarian that does home euthanasia, you can go to inhomepeteuthanasia.com, and they have a directory, and they actually have more information on that for you as well. So um, when a dog passes, and again, it's very normal, it's very natural, it's going to happen to all of us, nothing to fear. I think I think we're all it's more of the loss but we just that guilt that we feel. Um, especially if your dog has a prolonged illness. Um, so oftentimes, you know, people are interesting when they lose a dog and they're thinking about getting another dog. Some people are so distraught that they're like, I, I can't do it. I'm I'm never getting another dog. I and that's you know, it's it's a personal decision. Other people go out really quickly and without really thinking it through carefully, um, adopt another dog, which, you know, it, again, it, um, it depends on everyone and their situation, but some things to think about is that you should think about it very carefully. Um, and um, during this time when, when a dog has passed, remember the other pets in the home because they are feeling it as well. They are grieving as well. So give them some extra time and attention. Um, I think one of the greatest legacies you can give a passing dog is to um, give your love and compassion to another dog that so desperately needs it. There's so many dogs in shelters right now. Uh, and a lot of people want to get a dog of the same breed and color that looks just like the dog that died. Um, that usually is a mistake. The second dog is not the first dog. It's unfair to expect him to be. And so by choosing another dog that's physically different from the dog that has passed, um, it makes it a little easier, and you'll love and appreciate that new dog um, for his unique qualities. And if you're not sure what you want to do, you're feeling a little lonely, but you don't know if you want to make that commitment, you can always think about fostering dogs temporarily through a, um, a local rescue. They need foster homes for days, weeks, or sometimes long-term foster for months, so that might be something um, to think about. Okay, and um, something that people are thinking more about now, too, which is awesome, is pet trust planning. So when you're doing your will and your estate planning, um, it's, it's something to think about is to making plans for your pets because you shouldn't assume that a family member or friend is just going to take care of things the way you want. And you don't want to be a burden on them either because you don't know what kind of situation they're going to be in um, when, when you pass. So some options that are available would be one to create a pet trust. And that, that you have to um, hire an attorney. It's a bit costly. 
um, but that's certainly an option. Um, another option is to write out an agreement. You should certainly write something down. There's a pet protection agreement online if you want to know what to um, put in it, and you can download that. Um, it's important to tell people your wishes. Let them know frequently. Um, you can ask your retirement advisor or your financial advisor. So depending on your situation, they may have some ideas on um, how you can plan for the care um, of your pets when you pass on. And um, yeah, just if anything, write something down, write your wishes down, put them with your will, but please talk to whoever um, you want to take care of your animals or get them in the homes or that kind of thing um, prior so they're aware. So if you want more information on pet trust, you can go to ASPCA.org and then just type in pet trust. And there's a lot of information um, there as well. But it's something we need to think about. And we think about the kids, but we don't always think about what's going to happen um, with the animals, um, with our pets when we go. We want to make sure, you know, that they're dealt with the way we want them to. Um, so yes, this is my book, and all this information is in the book, as well as a lot more and a lot of um, resources for, for people. It's kind of everything you need to know from beginning to end um, of that senior, senior stage, senior time of life. And the Gray Muzzle Organization, um, if you're interested in more information than that, it's graymuzzle.org. And um, if any of you are interested in supporting us in, in any way, you can just go to the website. We have a lot of great resources and a nice um, newsletter as well. And so we're trying to get these dogs, these seniors in the shelters, uh, adopted out as soon as possible. So I'm about done. That, that kind of wraps it up. OK, well, um, oh gosh, do we have questions? You came to the right place, Jennifer because our folks have been typing in questions all along and I'm going to start going through these questions and then we're going to continue the discussion afterwards on the Merrick page. So Christy wants to know, is it better to feed an overweight senior dog senior dog food with the supplements needed or grain free senior with less supplements? Yeah, it's funny, you know, most people are um, wanting the grain free. Um, and maybe they're just having, I don't know, maybe their dogs are doing better on it. I think, too, your dog can become allergic at any time, just like we can, to anything. And oftentimes, you know, um, they can get, be allergic to the grain. And sometimes they're allergic to the to chicken as well. Um, so, you know, it depends on the dog. But I just find most people, you know, prefer the grain-free for their, for their dogs, particularly those in the senior years. Okay. Um... Um, our vet is really pushing teeth cleaning these days. Have they found new data that shows how important this is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could say, oh, keeping their teeth clean, however you can do it, is probably um, the most important thing you can do um, because, it get, like I said, it affects every organ in the body once, once the teeth get bad and they get the, the dental disease and so forth. And, you know, there's options. There's the anesthesia-free cleaning, which I've heard, you know, positive and negative things about. It just depends, I think, um, who's doing it. But, and, and a lot of people do brush their dog's teeth. I've heard some people use, like, the bronze toothbrush and, and such. But I think the majority of the people don't take the time to do it. And I'm guilty of that myself with four dogs. Um, so it's important to look at other ways you can keep that tartar off your dog's teeth, whether it be, you know, the bones that you give them, um, the supplements, you know, there's the powders and such you can put in the water that help with the tartar, and just looking at your dog's teeth. And, uh, again, if your dog kind of just stands at the bowl and doesn't want to eat, it could it could mean he's got some serious, serious um, dental pain going on as well. But, um, yeah, some dogs just, it's a constant battle keeping up with the teeth. And with other dogs, people say, I don't do anything, and the teeth are beautiful. So it depends on your dog. It's how aggressive you're going to have to be. But definitely um, do what you can to keep your dog's 
um, um, dental um, health in check. Fantastic. Uh, Brenda would like to know why it avoid brewer's yeast? She thought that was good. Um, yeah, that's on a list of, um, of ingredients that may not be, you know, I don't know that it's, it's a really bad um, ingredient, but, um, you know, what I've heard and read is sometimes, you know, it's probably not the best. So, you know, I don't have a lot of information on the on the brewer's yeast, but I've I've read, like I said, in different in different places that um, often dogs don't do well with it. So, um, Jennifer, we've had so many people asking for your slides. If you would please get them over to Brooke, would it be okay if we shared your slides? Sure, sure. I'll okay. Do that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, TB writes, I recently lost my therapy dog of 15 years. I have two others. Um, I have two others. Want to honor her with getting another therapy dog. Okay. Um, my 14-year-old pants heavily at night. Is this a pain indicator? Yes, yes. I should have mentioned that. Panting can very much so be a sign of anxiety, which can be, of course, a sign of pain. It could also mean that your dog's hot. And in the summer, if your dog has a, a thick coat, um, you might consider shaving them to see if that helps. But yes, panting can be a sign of pain. You want to look for other signs, you know, in conjunction with it. Um, is your dog acting differently in any other way? Um, you know, the lip licking, posture, the tail tucked under, you know, is he rubbing on things? That's, so, so look for other signs of pain. But, but yes, that's, um, that's, that could be a sign of something. Um, a dog's at least anxious, maybe not pain, but maybe something else is causing him anxiety. Okay. A um, couple of people have asked, why are tomatoes bad for dogs? Yeah, I don't know why specifically, but they're always on the list. And, you know, a lot of these things, like, um, for instance, garlic, um, it's on a lot of lists that are toxic for foods. I've also read that it is good for repelling mosquitoes in dogs. So I think a lot of these things are, it has to do with the quantity. And so maybe a little bit might not be too bad, um, but, you know, like maybe large quantities of tomatoes has been found to be bad in some dogs or toxic. So if, I just you wonder know, whether... If you made food, yeah. Oh, I'm well, sorry, yeah, go if ahead. If you made food and you give your dog tomatoes and he was fine, uh, he probably is, but um, it's on a lot of lists, yeah, tomatoes for some reason being toxic. So it's been toxic some dogs. But again, it has to do with the amount. Okay. Um, my lab has always slept on the bed. Now he's having trouble getting up. What do we do to help him? Yeah, he's probably in some pain. Um, well, they have some really nice ramps out there, you know, so you can give him a ramp to climb up on the bed. They also have a lot of really nice um, oh, um, you know, harnesses to, you know, put around the dog's chest so that you can help him get up on the bed and help him get in the car and up the stairs. And there's all kinds of new ones. I keep seeing even better designs coming out. So, um, one, yeah, you need to get him checked out because he's, uh, he's telling you he's in pain, that it hurts for him to jump up there. But, um, yeah, if you still want him up there, I would definitely get some sort of a ramp so that it's easier for him to climb up. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's see. You did not mention fish as um, as an ingredient. Um, yeah. Is mm -hmm. fish okay as I give my yeah, dog yeah. A salmon, no grain food? Yeah, yeah. Salmon and fish oil is great. I I just didn't mention all of the um, you know, uh, types of meat that should be. I was just giving some examples, but um, yes, my dogs like the salmon as well. Um, and the fish oils, again, are really good for, um, for well, they're good for all dogs, really, but in particular to the senior dogs, and it's, it's really good for arthritis as well. So, yeah, fish is good. Yes, uh, my dog loves the salmon skin. She would, yeah. it's, it's one of her favorite things. Um, Susie wants to know, how about homeopathy for hearing loss? 
Yeah, um, I'm not well versed on the homeopathy. Um, you know, they it, generally they treat a lot of chronic illnesses. I guess it would depend what's causing the hearing loss. But um, you know, I haven't heard specifically. Uh, uh, like I said, I haven't studied homeopathy too much. I have uh, a homeopathist. A home you wrote in a chapter more specifically about how it works. Um, but it's supposed to help. Like I said, it helps the physical, the mental, and the emotional um, aspects, you know, of the dog. So it kind of treats the whole the whole dog. So it might be something, yeah, that that you should look into. But I'm I'm not sure. It's, like I said, it depends on what's causing the hair's hearing loss, maybe. Okay, Denise asks um, a question. What can you do for deaf dogs? How can you make things easier for them? Yeah, um, and that's really common too as they get older. You want to start using some hand signals and just be aware that they can't hear you. Um, and obviously, um, yeah, just make sure they see you. They're going to start looking at, at you more for guidance. But as they start to lose their hearing, you might, with um, like the hear command, you might use your hand motioning here. Um, you know, use it for for sit or no or whatever. Start um, incorporating hand signals with the verbal, where they can still um, associate the two. And then when he's deaf, hopefully um, he'll be just on the hand signal. Okay. And boy, we got questions here. Um, is there an age when you shouldn't travel with a senior dog? Hmm. Um. I don't think there's an age. I think it depends on the dog's, you know, health and condition and also whether it's stressing him out or not. So maybe a dog that used to love to travel as he gets older, you know, things change, not feeling good, or or maybe just some anxiety comes up as you get older. Um, so I would look at the dog for that question and, and look for signs of anxiety. So, um, you know, one sign of stress could be just suddenly their hair starts falling out and the dandruff. Um, you'll notice that sometimes when they go to the vet. <laughs> um, panting, the excessive lip licking and eye blinking and yawning. And, you know, again, it's not just one of those signs, but if you see a bunch of them, uh, maybe refusing to eat too. So um, I would leave it up to the dog. I don't think there's an age. Um, you know, if, if the dog has trouble with incontinence or that kind of thing, that might, um, you know, that might come into play. But, uh, yeah, just... Just look at your dog and, and see what he's telling you. And it is time for our question. You guys ready? Everybody get ready. Get your typing fingers ready. So um, here we go. And I need the full answer on this. What is the only safe over-the-counter remedy that you can give to your senior dog for pain. Plumberry is the, was the first answer. And Plum, you are the winner. So what we'd like you to do, Plum, is we'd like you to shoot us an email with your name and address to info at doggingtonpost.com. Uh, Plum was answer, asking question, answering questions that we hadn't even asked because she wanted to win so much, but she stuck around and actually did win. Um, she got in just before a bunch of you did. Gosh, so many of you um, knew that. So um, she wins a t voucher for a 25-pound bag of Merrick's New Grain Beef, Maine Grain-Free Real Texas Beef Dog Food, and Merrick is also donating a bag in Plum's honor to our friends at the National Mill Dog Rescue. Everybody head over to Facebook to continue the conversation. Jennifer will be there in just a few moments to answer your questions. Jennifer, this is going to go down as one of our really great webinars. You're an expert. Um, it's clearly recognized you have a love for senior dogs and you share that love with us today and you share that love with the dogs every day. If you'll get your slides over to Brooke, we will share them um, on our Facebook page and we'll get the good folks over at Merrick to share them as well. So 
we want to thank you guys so much for being here in this wonderful seminar. Let's all type in thanks to Jennifer for being here. Yeah, thanks, Harlan. Enjoy all right, here you. come the thanks. Here come the thanks. All right. Okay, Plum, that address is info at doggingtonpost.com. All right, lots of people typing in thanks. Um, Brandy and Brooke from the Doggington Post in the back background, thank you so much. Thank you, Merrick, for sponsoring us today. And we will be back with our next webinar. Remember, all the webinars um, you will be able to find and listen to uh, at thedoggingtonpost.com. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.